it's been a long time since I have uh, uploaded any um, any videos. Um, there was nothing that's been uploaded or worked on recently. So today I thought about um, firing up a hands-on lab um, on BGP, Border Gateway Protocol. It's a very basic lab, but it does address some of the fundamental and important principles on BGP. So first we will cover the differences between IBGP and eBGP, so the internal BGP and external BGP, the principles of NextHop self, and also the concept of root reflectors and why this is better than a full mesh. So as you can see on this topology, I've got three AS numbers, 6501, 6502, 6503. I'm running OSPF on each of these autonomous systems. And the OSPF is running only between the links within the autonomous systems. So R1, R3, for example, R3, R2, there's OSPF running and R1, R2. Between R1, R4, I'm not running OSPF. So no RGP between the autonomous systems. R4, R5, OSPF is running. And the same goes for 6503, AS6503, where I'm running OSPF between the internal links. There's also a convention for loopbacks. Each of these routers has a loopback. R1, for example, is 1.1.1.1.1, which is just a router number times 4. It makes things a little bit easier to remember. So R3 would be 3.3.3.3, 3, 3, 3, 3. R2 would be 2.2.2, 2, 2, 2, and so forth. So for BGP, we will start off with AS6501, where we will configure IBGP between R1 and R3 and R1 and R2. So before we start the configuration, there's a few things that I would like to check first. Is I'm on router 1, and I would like to check what is my loopback on this router. So it's... 11111. I would also like to check what is the IGP uh, for and which interfaces is actually advertising. So which interfaces are part of OSPF in this particular case. So I can see that uh, 10121, 10131, these are the links from router 1 towards router 2 and 3, as well as the loopback which is advertised under the passive interface. So next, I will just double check by running my show RP interface brief, which will give me a list of the interfaces and the RP addresses configured or the subnet configured on these interfaces. So one of the best practices when you configure IBGP, the internal BGP, is that the PGP session, they're running between loopback addresses as opposed to link net addresses. So it is also best practice, or so it's a good thing to verify that you can ping between loopbacks. So I'm checking whether on router 1, I can ping the loopback of router 2 and 3 when it's sourced from the loopback address of R1. And as you can see, it works here, which means we're ready to start configuring our BGP. So we start by going into the router BGP configuration mode, setting the AS number. Best practice is to always set or hard code the router ID, which I'm using the loopback address for. Another thing I do is to remove the default RPV4 unicast. And what essentially this does, it tells the router to be ready to have more than RPV4 as an address family. So it could be that I'll be adding 
BGP for RPv6 unicast. It could be I'll be adding some uh, VPN v4 under BGP for the support of VRFs and so forth. So it is something that I tend to do with the iOS based nodes. Here I'm setting the the neighbor. That's the that's the actually establishing the configuration of the peering. So neighbor two two two, which is router two, and I'm saying that the remote AS number is six five zero one. So same as router one, which makes it an RBGP. An important configuration line here is to use the update source as loopback zero, which essentially says that I'm initiating my BGP session not from the link net, but from the loopback address. This is very important and it's, it's something that can be useful to know for troubleshooting. I'm doing the same for router 3. And then you have to go under the address family where you activate every session for these peers. So for 222, you just activate it and you will do the same for 333. So if you had an IPv6 uh, session, for example, um, you will be using address family IPv6 and activating um, in the same way we've done it for IPv4. On router 2, it will essentially be exactly the same configuration, same AS number. and set the router ID to the loopback, which is 2222, two, two, and remove the default IPv4 as an address family. Set my neighbor for router one with remote AS6501. Remember the update source loopback address. And then under the address family, I have to activate this session. So this should be enough to have a session up and running between R1 and R2. And it should come up, hopefully, on the log that the session is up. I'll check it anyway. Okay, it has come up, but I can see that the session is up. It is established. So you can see that it is being established for about two seconds. There are zero prefixes that are received. If I go into router one and I run the same command. So I'm using the, the old or traditional show RP BGP summary um, for this command. I can see that neighbor two is up or router two is up. Router three is still idle because simply I haven't configured anything on, uh, for router three yet. So there are two ways I can pull this configuration or this show command is show BGP RPV for unicast or show RP BGP summary. Let's configure router three quickly. So same as we did for router two. Effectively, we, we could have copied and pasted part of the config part of the router ID part. Set my neighbor remote AS6501 since it's an IBGP. So the difference here is just so you can have a head start for eBGP, the AS number, remote AS, will be different, that's all. So under the address family, again, I need to activate my session towards router 1. And the session should come up. So it comes up on the log as neighbor 1111 is up. So short IP BGP summary is one way to verify this. You can see it's been up for seven seconds. Again, no prefixes received. This is another way, which is the one I prefer the most, show BGP RPV4 Unicar summary, which gives me the option to also use different address family, uh, use the show command for different address families. So I can use, for example, show BGP RPV6 Unicast if I wanted to. 
So now that I have some IBGP sessions between R1 and R2, R1 and I3, let's try to advertise one of the prefixes, so the loopback address, for example, of router 2 into a BGP process. So I'll check my loopback address. You can see here is, is a slash 32. So how do I advertise it? There are different ways we can advertise prefixes in BGP. You can use my, one of my preferred ones is the network command. So you go under the BGP process once more under the address family and you use the network command where you simply use the actual network. And for the mask, you have to be very precise and exact. So you use the subnet mask for the prefix or the range that you would like to advertise. So I'm using 245, 245, 245, 245, and that should be enough to advertise or get the route into the BGP process. <clears throat> As you can see here, the show BGP IPv4 unicast shows that this network is now advertised is local. So that 0.0.0.0, .0 means that the prefix is locally originated. Uh, different attributes, they mean different things. So the metric, the local preference, the weight is a default at the moment, 32768. They, they are attributes that we would go through in other sessions. So I can see by specifically uh, doing the show IP BGP IP for Unicast for this prefix that it is advertised to the update groups. So this is now rooted in, um, in BGP, whether it's in the IP routing table or not, varies. So on router one, I can see that, or I check whether this prefix, this network is in the routing, is in the BGP table, and it is. Next hop, which is the advertising router, that's the router ID of R2. But this doesn't mean that it's, this prefix in the, is in the IP routing table. And the reason is simple is because OSPF has a better route to this prefix than BGP. Is this prefix in router 3? So we check specifically for this prefix and it's not in the network table. So this route has been advertised from R2 to R1. R1 received it, but R3 has not received it. This is one of the very important principles of using the root reflector or fully meshing your network or your peers. So what happens in RBGP is when an RBGP node receives a prefix, it will advertise it to the next router, but that next router would not advertise it further. So in our case, R1 will receive the prefix from R2 and will have it in this BGP table, but it would not advertise it further to R3. So how do we fix this? There are two ways of doing this. Either we fully mesh our AS so we need to have an additional session between R2 and R3. This is doable when you have only three or four maybe routers, BGP routers. But what happens if you're a service provider with more than 60 routers? It is not practical to actually fully mesh all your nodes. So here comes the concept of root reflectors. And root reflector is, is almost similar to your DR and BDR in OSPF. So your root reflector is the guys that will that everyone will talk to, and he would be 
advertising or distributing these prefixes to other root reflectors clients. And what we could do in our AS6501, for example, we can select one of the router, routers as a root reflector. It could be anyone, as a matter of fact. When you get into the design uh, kind of level, it is not a random choice. You have to be very careful with where you put your root reflector. In our case, I would like to have R3 as a root reflector. So let's start configuring R3 or making change to R3 so it is it becomes a root reflector and can take care of this uh, necessary uh, design or setup where the roots are reflected. So it, what would happen when R3 is a root reflector is R2 will announce its prefix 222 to R3 and R3 will reflect it further. So this is just to show you the shortcut that I've been using, which is the show run SRB. It stands for show run section, root to BGP, which will, it will grab a section of the configuration to show just the part that is BGP related. So it's the same output, essentially. Show run SRB or SRO for OSPF. It's a good shortcut if you are in a rush. So this is the, the, the configuration of Router 3 as it was before, and I would like to start making changes to it now so R3 acts as a root reflector. So it's not much of a change to it. The, the, the big change is to essentially mark or set the remote routers at root reflectors client. The root reflector client will be R1 and R2, and those routers, they would know, they would not know any different. They would be completely oblivious to the fact that they are root reflectors. So on R1 and R2, you don't need to make any configuration changes whatsoever. So again, we dive into the router BGP process for 6501. And under the address family RPv4, Just change that back once more. So address family RPv4, unicast. I'll set my remote router or P router, so neighbor, I'll start with neighbor 111, and I'll just add the command root reflected client. So this normally, in production, it will bounce the session, meaning that the BGP session will tear and be re-established. So it's something that I would recommend you don't do it in daytime, for example, if you have a process as such. So now R1 is a client for R3. And I should have the session back again as it was before. The only difference is that R1 is a client and R1 is completely unaware of that fact. So no changes on this side on R1. R1 is still receiving the prefix that uh, router2 is sending. It's not advertising to any peers. So having R1 as a root reflector client is not enough for R2, for R1 to advertise what it is receiving from R2. So R2 is not 
a client. It's not a root reflector client. So what we need to do next is to set another session where R2 is a client for R3. So the end result here is, is a full mesh, uh, essentially, that we have so far. So we have a session between R1 and R2, R1 and R3, that was the original sessions, and then we're adding another one between R3 and R2. So, and R1 and R2 are root reflector clients to R3. So we have both principles applied. We are fully meshing here, as well as using the root reflector client design or configuration. So what we need to do to prove our concept that the root reflector design is enough is we have to tear down that session between R1 and R2. So we get to a simple design where we don't have a full mesh, but we have a root reflector taking care of reflecting roots from one client to another. But let's finish up this part of the configuration. So this would be just a normal RBGP configuration so far. And remember the update source loopback zero, always for RP, RBGP when you are using the loopbacks as best practice, as, as the source of your sessions and also the target for the remote sessions. I'll activate the session. I'll just check a few things here, whether the session is actually established. So now that we have the desired setup that we wanted, which is R3 acting as root reflector, remember that we have this session, R1 and R2, which essentially defeats the purpose because we have a full mesh, R1, R3, R1, R2, and R2, R3, they're all configured as RB, IBGP peers. On top of that, we have R3 acting as root reflector. So what we need to do to validate our design or the concept of root reflector is to admin down or shut down the BGP session between R1 and R2. So this will leave us with R1 peering of R3 and R2 peering of R3 R3 acting as root reflector. So in this scenario, when I go to root R1, I don't need to wipe off the whole configuration that I've made already uh, for R2. So this session here that I have for R2, I don't need to wipe off all the configuration behind it. What I could do is to admin this session specifically towards this peer node. And this will allow me to roll back if I need to. So going in under the BGP process, I just shut down this neighbor. And as you can see in the log, you can see that this specific neighbor is admin down. And also check it by running the short RP BGP summary, where you can see this specific neighbor is down for about nine seconds or admin down for nine seconds. So this is a smart way to shut down for one reason or the other a neighbor without having to remove the whole configuration. Now I'll check if I'm receiving that route from R2 and I can see that I am indeed receiving it. So specifically that route and the router ID is 22222, which is R2, but you can see that it's from 33333, which is the root reflector ID for router 3. I can see that it can be a bit confusing that the router ID is the same as the prefix. So what we could do is to go to router 2 and configure an additional loopback 
that is a little bit more obvious as a prefix and different from the router ID and advertise it in the BGP process. So I create loopback 20 and give it address 20, 20, 20. And just to make this a little bit more interesting than the slash 32, we make this one a slash 24. I'll just make sure, okay, I've got one octet too many. Just check my loopback address once more. Okay. So this is a slash 24, not a slash 32 as we used earlier. So this is configured on R2 and we will add it to the BGP process. So it's no longer going directly to R1, but it should go via R3. R3 will reflect it to R1. So I will just add it to the BGP process here or advertise it via BGP, same as we did earlier using the network command. Remember the mask has to be exactly as the subnet itself. So here be careful, it has to be the network. So it's not, as a last octet should not be 20, but it should be zero because it's a slash 24 and the mask has to be the slash 24. So here I check if my prefix is actually advertised. So I can see that it is, if I've made any mistakes, for example, I use the slash 27 or what have you, I would not have, I would not see that line that I'm highlighting now. So now I know R2 is advertising this prefix. I'll check if it's specifically received on R1. It is received and the next hop is 2.2.2.2, .2 .2 .2 .2, there's R2. And it's definitely not received from R2 directly, it's from R3. So as you can see here, is received from this router ID or this router with this router ID and from the root reflector. So now we have validated the concept of root reflector because we don't have a full mesh. In the next step, let's establish our eBGP session, external BGP between 6501 and 6502. We will be using the link net for this one. The configuration is very similar. The only difference is, is that the remote AS is different. You'll be the 6502 and we are using link nets so we don't need to use the update loopback source and what have you. So that's 4.4 is the RP address of router 4, AS6502. Address family RPv4 unicast. And then I'll activate the session. Same thing on router 4. So here the process, you have to be very careful. It has to be 6502. Set my router ID as best practice. Remove the default behavior of BGP to allow for more address families in the future. That would be 6501. Address family RPV4 Unicast and I'll activate my session. 
So we should ideally see something in the log popping up, confirming that the session is up. There you go. So let's see what is router 4 receiving in terms of BGP prefixes. So it's receiving two, as you can see, and these are the loopbacks that we advertised on router 2. So that's loopback 0 on router 2 and loopback 20 that we created afterwards. The slash 32 and the slash 24. The next hop, as you can see, is 10141, which is the link net address of R1. So the behavior is different for the next hop when it comes to eBGP and iBGP. So let's configure our iBGP between R4 and R5. Same as we did earlier. So now we just check whether the RPV4 unicast summary is confirming that we have a session that is up. So we have a session with R4, between R5 and R4, and we're also seeing the two prefixes received. So they're the ones received by or created in router 2. Let's check the details of one of the prefixes specifically. So that's loopback 20. And you can see the AS number is received from is 6501. But the next hop is 10141. So it's received from root to 4, but the next hop has not changed from being root to 1 link net. Here you can see there is an issue. I cannot ping 10141. So R1 is advertising loopback 20 on R2, which is 2020 to R4. R4 pass it on or advertises it to router 5. On router 5, let's configure or let's advertise the, um, the loopback, loopback zero on R4, on R5. The full slash 32. So what should happen here is that R5 will advertise this prefix 5555 slash 32 to R4 R4 will advertise that to R1. Now let's see what happens. So just following the trail of this prefix, 
So R4 naturally receives this from R5, and you can see the router ID. By the way, because we only have two routers on AS6502, we don't need to have a root reflector. They are fully meshed regardless. So what happens in R1? So R1 receives this prefix 5555-32 and it shows that is AS6502. 10144, which is the RP address, the LinkNet RP address of router 4. You can see the router ID is for R4. So we have no problem. So far, it looks good. And R4 will advertise this to the root reflector. So let's see what happens here. On the root reflector, this is where we start having issues. R5 sends to R4. R4 advertised to R1. R1 advertised to R3, but since it's advertising an eBGP prefix, the source or the next hop is actually of R4. So we have an issue. This prefix from 5, root of 5, is not in the routing table. This is our problem. This is our issue. Is the next hop on AS6502 is still the RP address of R4. And R4 is not advertised in the IGP on AS6501. So AS6501 and router R3 does not know this address. It doesn't have a root for this IP address. And as a result, R3, the root reflector, or any actually router, would not, BGP router, would not advertise a root or prefix. It doesn't have um, an IP root for its sender. This is where the next hop self concept comes into play. So what we have to do here, we have to change the default behavior of eBGP. So when R1 receives the prefix from R4 and announces it to R3, it has to modify that next hop, which was initially 104144, sorry, which is the RP address on R4 to itself. So this 10144, we have to change it to R1, and R1 will do that by setting itself as the next hop or as next hop self before advertising it to R3. Just reviewing the configuration and then we can make the change quickly. This is a very important concept that actually, that actually can lead to a lot of issues in your network or is very good to know in terms of troubleshooting. So when you look specifically at that prefix as we did in R3 and you see that the route, uh, the next hop is inaccessible, you know that there's an issue with either IGP, which sometimes is very unlikely, or the behavior needs to be changed as one of the peering nodes. So here I just, while I'm sending the routes, to three, I've changed it to next hop self. So it goes from inaccessible. Let's just check if the change has taken effect. It will just take a little bit of time because it's uh, I'm running on a on a CML lab and not on on actual boxes where it happens a lot faster. So just give it a few seconds and I'll refresh once more. So you can see that the change has taken effect. So the remote AS has not changed, it's still 6502. That's 
exactly how it was before, but the next hop has changed to root to one look back address or root to ID because of the command that we use between R1 towards R3, where R1 sets itself as next hop self. So now R3 can do its job as root reflector and advertise that prefix to R2. So these are the, the, the basically some of the fundamental principle that you need to know about. They're very simple, but they are fundamental. So you need to know them, understand how they work and where you need them. IBGP and EBGP, the differences, the, how the behavior of next hop is affected by these sessions, where to use the look back as your source for IBGP, next hop self concept, the root reflector or full mesh and so forth. So in future videos, what we will do is to add sessions between AS6503 and 6501 and then R6 established sessions between R6 and R5, playing with the way the prefixes are preferred by using the BGP attributes. So we would, for example, choose to go via R7, R2 instead of R6, R5 or the other way around. So I hope you enjoyed this and I'll see you guys soon.